All right. And oh, how many of you go here on here now? Uh, five. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you meet the up back in syndrome in Utah? Do we see it? Yeah. No, in, for in, sure. Yep. Yeah, we definitely will see it here quite a bit. Um, You know, lots of trauma, like from car accidents, trauma, different fractures quite frequently. And that's the same thing as, as for you guys. We just have to be able to address it, deal with it fast and and identify it quickly. <laughs> Being suspicious. I think when it's, we're all good when it's obvious, it's obvious, but it's when it's more subtle that it, we can worry. That's when you risk missing it. So, but yeah, we can dive right in. We can start and then people will catch up. Yeah. Sound good to you guys? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Okay, so this week we're going to talk about compartment syndrome as we kind of briefly started and then I'm going to touch on crush injury as well because that kind of go, it's along the same line of trauma either blunt or um, you know just kind of trauma in with orthopedics and staying in that vein. So just to start us off I have a question I know you guys didn't get these earlier but I think it's just a good way to get us talking there's a few questions interspersed throughout this lecture. So a 35-year-old male complains of progressively worsening right leg pain two hours after undergoing a closed reduction in the ER for a mid-shaft tibia fracture. After splint is removed, physical exam reveals a firm, tender compartment of his right anterior leg with diminished sensation in the area. Pulses in the foot are 2 plus. Compartment pressure is 30 millimeters hg. The patient's vital signs are temp of 36, a pulse of 98, respiratory rate of 18, blood pressure of 110 over 55, uh, O2 of 98% on room air. Which of the following is the most appropriate course of action? A, elevate the leg and recheck compartment pressure in one hour. B, resplint with a looser wrap, discharge the next day with next day follow-up. C, order an MRI of the leg, or D, consult orthopedic surgery for possible fasciotomy. So you guys want to look at it and then answer in the chat, and I'll just give you a minute or two, just because then we'll dive right in. Anybody else want to give it a shot? I think A is okay, right? So actually in this one, so the compartment pressure is 30, which is too high. So in this one, we would want to consult orthopedic surgery for possible fasciotomy. So at this point with that compartment already being at 30 millimeters HG, at that point, you would need to consider compartment syndrome. And then the definitive treatment, which we'll kind of dive into this would be a, a fasciotomy. So at this point with that compartment uh, pressure at 30, you want to be highly concerned for compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome occurs secondary to increased pressure. The pressure builds from edema, bleeding, um, anything that can be applied externally can also cause a closed compartment syndrome. The compartments, especially in the lower limb, but throughout our body are closed. There's fascia, muscle, bone that surround the tissue and keep it to a certain space. So it can only occupy so much space. So what happens with compartment syndrome is it just gets so filled with the fluid or substance that there's no room for expansion. 
And that will initially what happens is it compresses the venous system because our veins are more compressible. So veins are pressed down and that uh, the outflows decrease and that increases the pressure even further because then you get an increased fluid buildup in that area. As the fluid increases, the pressure increases, you start to compress the arteries, the capillaries, and then the nerves, which causes damage. When the arteries are compressed, you're getting decreased blood flow to muscle tissue, and then also the nerves. And then the nerves themselves are being compressed. So that can lead to a decrease in blood flow to muscles, which will ultimately necrose and die. And then that can even worsen the swelling. So this is kind of a positive feedback loop where the swelling and the tissue damage causes worsening swelling and then worsening tissue damage. So you kind of get driven down this line where it will inevitably cause uh, damage that is not reversible. The lower leg, so particularly where the tibia and fibula are, are the most commonly affected areas for compartment syndrome. Those compartments are very small. There are three throughout the lower leg, so they're extremely small. Um, tibial shaft fractures are the most common injury associated with compartment syndrome, and that's uh, important to note that those are open and closed fractures. So just because you have an open fracture does not mean that you're not at risk for developing a secondary compartment syndrome. And that's because that anterior compartment of the lower leg is very small and confined, and the fractures tend to be quite traumatic and cause a lot of swelling. Um, other causes of compartment syndrome would include a crush injury, burn injuries, uh, venous thrombosis, ischemia, reperfusion injuries, rhabdomyolysis, bleeding disorders, iratrogenic uh, intravenous infusion. So in an upper arm, if you if you don't have an IV in the proper place, that can lead to compartment syndrome. IV drug use or skin popping where you're injecting uh, intravenous drugs directly into the muscle belly or prolonged limb compression. Young men um, have the highest incidence of developing compartment syndrome and that might be some more likely to develop fractures and injuries. Um, risk factors, other risk factors besides being male are uh, to be hypotensive, to have high transfusion requirements. So polytrauma, people that, that are on massive transfusion protocols are more likely to develop that. Um, people with open fractures, joint dislocations, uh, gut shot wounds, vascular injuries. Um, and then just remember two compartment syndrome can occur without any significant trauma at all. So it can be a more minor trauma. Uh, sorry, I'm just double checking this here. Okay. So their irreversible tissue damage will likely occur if ischemia persists for more than six hours. So, you know, it's important. And throughout this lecture, remember when I'm telling you that this is, uh, it's a, Diagnosis you want to make quickly and you want to be aware of and you we got to be constantly checking because if you miss this and somebody's not treated appropriately, it can cause permanent damage, which leads to significant morbidity and mortality. Um, pain is the most consistent symptom in compartment syndrome. So pretty much everybody with compartment syndrome, most people, I should say, are going to have significant amount of pain and that can lead you to the diagnosis. So the pain slightly out of proportion, which can be hard to like determine because somebody has a fracture, they're obviously going to be in pain, but you want to just kind of keep your eye on it. Sensory changes. So the tingling, numbness, paralysis, they're not going to occur till a little bit later, usually 30 to 60 minutes of nerve ischemia. And remember the nerves, it's going to be a later thing because it would take time for the nerves to not get blood flow from capillaries being compressed or the nerve being compressed. So kind of a later finding. Pulselessness is one of the last findings you'll find um, because there are collaterals in most areas where you can get blood flow even if there's part of the vasculature that's being compressed. Um, and so it really is only going to occur if the compartment pressure exceeds the systolic pressure. So remember, that's also going to be, that, that can be a lot of pressure that in some cases can be over 120 millimeters HD, which is not going to occur till much later on. Um, and like I said, delaying diagnosis can lead to morbidity and then even mortality. People will lose limbs and changes their lives or it can kill them. 
Uh, if irreversible muscle and nerve damage occurs, then uh, the, the person would be at risk for long-term problems, but also in more immediate things, you can develop contractures, chronic pain, local infections, sepsis, rhabdo, and then acute renal failure death because the longer you have muscle damage, the more likely you are to incur other problems. So when you're seeing these patients, the history and physical, so like we talked about, you're in a pain out of proportion. It's going to be the earliest finding, so out of proportion to what the injury is. The pain that people will experience is significantly worse with passive stretching um, or external muscle compression. So you can do a squeeze test. Again, this is going to be very tough if they have an underlying fracture or anything, but you, you will know that it's like just the compartment, not the bone. So if you're feeling on the calf or the shin, you can feel that area and see if it feels hard to the touch or they have pain with that. If a patient has had a nerve block, like a regional block or epidural, has an epidural infusion, they have an analgesic pump or they're altered or have had multiple like polytrauma, then this can really delay diagnosis because they're not going to necessarily be able to tell you that they're in significant pain. And so in these patients, you know, it's important to do continuous checks and doing your neurovascular checks, doing your reassessment, looking at the skin and kind of making sure you're not missing these, especially in, in high risk injuries, like we kind of talked about last week. And I knew you guys know the classic signs, you know, for compartment syndrome, it's called the five P's. So it's pain, the pain out of proportion, pallor, meaning pale in color, paresthesia, so tingling, numbness, paresis, or paralysis, so in unable to move, pulselessness, and then poikilothermic, which means they can't, they don't have any sensation for warmth or cold. So these are all kind of testing. They're not, you don't have to have all of them. Um, you know, most of the time, if, if you do have three or more, then it really increases your likelihood of having compartment syndrome or that being the diagnosis. Um, but if there's any of the, any one of those, in an ex especially an extremity that you're worried about, then you want to be thinking about compartment syndrome and just continue serial exams. So with diagnosis, you're going to obtain x-rays of the extremity most of the time, the affected limb, uh, any area, see if there's fractures underlining those, see what the injury pattern is. If there's any suspicion for a vascular injury, so say you you know, there's something else going on. You think maybe they severed an artery or based on the injury pattern, uh, if you see them bleeding, obviously, then you may need to consider doing a CTA of the extremity to see if that vessel's intact. If not, then you'd obviously need to get vascular surgery involved. Even if there's a pulselessness, you know, if they're not highly concerned with compartment syndrome or there's, there's some skepticism, then sometimes you will get a CTA to see if it's because there's compartment syndrome and it's compressing or if the vessel has been severed. As far as labs, they're not diagnostic. There's no diagnose, diagnostic labs. You can uh, consider getting a creatinine kinase, which we'll talk about a little later for rhabdo, urinalysis, a CMP, look at the electrolytes, renal function, um, and just keep your eye on those things as well, just to make sure that they don't have any other uh, issues that are contributing. And then with pressure monitoring, so there is a device, I'm not sure what your guys' availability is, but there's a device, it's called a Striker, which is a brand name, and, and it's pretty easy to use. Here, a lot of times orthopedic surgery will use them, but it looks like a little gun, has a needle attached to it. You'll insert the Striker into the compartment that you want to measure to measure the pressure. If you do not have a striker available or you don't have orthopedic surgery. Another option, which is really great, is you can use an arterial line setup to monitor the pressure. So you'll set up an arterial line just as you would if you were going to insert it into an artery to monitor blood pressure. But once you've, and you can actually use a central venous pressure monitor as well. So you set that up, you get it all hooked up to the monitor. Instead of inserting the needle the transducer into the artery, you're going to in insert it directly into the compartment. You may need to use a slightly longer needle than you would for an arterial setup, just based on depending on what compartment you're looking at, and then you'll insert it. The only thing to remember with this is make sure that you 
put your transducer, like you put the monitor and the screen and the monitor on the level height with the extremity so that you don't, that doesn't affect it. And I put a hyperlink in here for a YouTube video so you can watch the video and, and kind of learn about it because it's a pretty neat little thing, especially if you don't have the appropriate device or you don't have ortho red, like orthopedic surgery right there to help you out with that. Um, so as far as pressure, so an absolute pressure over 30, like at or equal to 30 millimeters HG um, would be an indication for a fasciotomy or if the delta pressure is less than 30. And that delta pressure would be your diastolic pressure minus the compartment pressure. Um, so either of those things would be an indication for a fasciotomy. So just remember like over 30 and be concerned that your pressure, the pressure is too high. Kind of like our question. So with treatment, the only real treatment for fasciotomy for, for compartment syndrome is a surgical fasciotomy. And that is where they will widely open the skin and the fascia of all suspected compartments. Um, you know, I guess you could, uh, in an ER, if you were really remote, this isn't that far-fetched to think about us having to do, but most places they'll have orthopedic surgery and they would perform this. And I've, I've never performed one myself. Um, it was, it's pretty aggressive insertion and cut. You got to go fairly deep and know that anatomy well. So consult your orthopedic surgeon or trauma surgeon, depending on the area. You know, we're really talking about extremities because we're in orthopedic surgery and it's much more common, but you can get compartment syndrome of the abdomen or the thorax. So that would be trauma surgeon. Treat their pain. That is something you can do. You know, treating their pain is not going to change or mask this and it might help them be more comfortable. So make sure you're adequately treating pain. Then also make sure that all peripheral lines, bandages, splints, dressings are removed. So don't leave any ACE bandages on. Don't leave anything on. Take IVs out of this site. You know, really make sure that it's clear of everything. You can also elevate it while you're waiting for them. It, you know, it can help even a little bit. It doesn't change that they would need treatment, but it can, it's not going to make things worse. And then manage any associated injuries. So if you feel as though you have a fracture and it's developing compartment syndrome, or you're worried, you need to reduce that fracture as well, because that will reduce eventual edema. So treat the fracture, reduce any fractures that you might, that might be there. Treat other injuries. If the patient has had blood loss or is anemic, you need to, to manage those things as well because they will worsen. If somebody is, you know, if so, you know, if somebody's hypotensive, they will start to third space, they get fluid into the extra, extra vascular areas and spaces and that increases swelling. So if they need blood, give them blood. If they need fluid, give them fluid because that will lessen the severity of the compartment syndrome. So question two, kind of moving on. So 28 year old male is working on a construction site when a piece of concrete wall that he was erecting fell onto his left lower extremity. Despite attempts, it took emergency responders two hours to remove the slab from his extremity. He denies other injuries. He did not hit his head or lose consciousness. He has no past medical history. On physical exam, patient has a temperature of 36, respiratory rate of 18, Heart rate of 125 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 90 over 58. His O2 is 92% on room air. Left lower extremity is as shown. What is the best immediate treatment for this patient? A, place a tourniquet above the level of the injury. B, get an x-ray of the injured extremity. C, administer one liter of normal saline. Or D, consult orthopedic surgery. And I, you know, we know, we all know, like in real life, you're going to be doing a lot of these things at the same time, you know, a lot of what we talk about at the same time. But if you're, imagine you're in the, you know, you're in your trauma bay and you're talking to your nurses and everybody, like what's the very first thing that you're going to tell them to do for this patient that has been 
under a piece of concrete slab for two hours and they have a high heart rate and their blood pressure is a little bit low and there's no active bleeding. Yeah, so there's no no bleeding in this area. No, I mean it's minimal bleeding, but it's not the bleeding's controlled. Yeah, so we'll kind of talk about this. It's so actually the answer I would do is so I would say C. So you're gonna give him a one liter of normal saline. So our kind of our next topic and what we're gonna delve into is crush injury. And the reason for the one liter of normal saline is so this guy has been under concrete and his tissue has been under that concrete for two hours. That extremity looks awful. And you know, is he gonna lose that extremity? Maybe. Are you you're definitely gonna need to get an x-ray and you're definitely gonna need to consult orthopedic surgery. We can look at it because there's a clear fracture fracture there and it's just very mangled. The issue is that he also has probably sustained a significant amount of muscle damage. And with that muscle damage and not getting blood flow to that area, he's now released, he's releasing potassium, he's you know, releasing other things into his body as you removed that concrete that can lead to more serious manifestations aside from the extremity. So on him, because he's tachycardic, his blood pressure is low, I would immediately give a liter of IV fluids to him. And then you want it to be normal saline. And we'll kind of dive into this and then you can rethink about this question at the end too. So crush injury is the result of physical trauma from prolonged compression of the torso, limb, or other body parts. The resultant injury to the soft tissues, muscle, and nerves can be due to the primary effect of the trauma or ischemia related to compression. So in addition to possible direct muscle or organ injury after release of the compressive force, severe crush injury results in swelling to the effective area with possible muscle necrosis and then neurological dysfunction. Um, and then the soft tissue injury can be due to secondary inju injury from compartment syndrome. So on top of this all, because you have something you can get compartment syndrome, which as we talked about before is caused by the decrease in venous blood flow. So then building up of fluids. So this is the, the crush injury. So the causes of crush injury, you know, we've probably all seen it at some point being trapped under a vehicle or related to like an industrial or construction or agricultural accidents. It's where these occur pretty frequently. Very common in natural disasters, major earthquakes, mass casualty events. Um, if a building collapses or there's been an entrapment, you can see them in stampede injury as well. Stamp like humans are stampeded. Um, so the compressive force causes direct tissue swelling while including venous outflow. So kind of we talked about another one. And then prolonged compression will cause a resultant cellular death, the myonecrosis, which can lead to a crush syndrome. So that's a big thing with crush injuries is you're worried not only about the orthopedic injury from the crush injury, but also crush syndrome. So crush syndrome is the systemic manifestations that occur from the injury and those can lead to organ dysfunction and even death. Um, so what usually happens is there is so much muscle injury from the from lack of blood flow. So you get this necrosis of the muscle and then direct muscle damage, which causes swelling as well. And then the cutting off of vasculature. Um, so what this can lead to, one thing is a, like a rhabdomyolysis. So the muscle dies and dies and then it releases uh, creatinine kinase, and it releases these heme products into the bloodstream. That will lead to what's called rhabdomyolysis. And what happens with that is these intracellular muscle constitutions will go into the circulation. And then when they're in the circulation, your body wants to get rid of them. So they try to filter them through the kidney. But as they go through the kidney, they will cause a significant amount of damage. So the volume depletion can cause 
the renal ischemia, you can get these heme casts that go through the kidney that also cause obstruction and injury, and that can lead to acute kidney injury. Um, this can also, because the kidneys aren't working right, you can get worsening hypovolemia, so decrease in fluid in your vessels, as well as increased potassium and low calcium and high ure urea, and then an acidosis. So really those are the big things with that can be caused by rhabdo. You get this hypovolemia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia, and metabolic acidosis. And I'm gonna harp on this a few times, but the other thing with crush and injury syndrome, and rhabdo, what can occur is you can get a severe hyperkalemia. So the potassium goes up in our body when there's muscle damage. When that potassium goes up in the body, then that can cause all kinds of major issues because it's really important for how our smooth muscles work. So in particularly cardiac muscle. So hyperkalemia can lead to multiple things, which we'll kind of talk about even more with the physical manifestations. So with crush injury on scene, so this big thing that'll come up if you ever, you know, people may call you from the ER, like you're in the ER and they call you to ask what, what do we do or you're consulted or you're part of a rescue team. So on the scene for a crush injury, you're going to make sure you maintain the scene safety, look out for yourself and your team, secure the patient's airway if you can, any way, if it's bagging or giving oxygen, and then give IV fluids like we talked about because that can prevent that it can help kind of manage the elevated potassium, it can also help, help any third spacing and problems from the crush syndrome. You can give, so I would recommend just doing normal saline until you know what the patient's potassium is and for any crush injury or syndrome because there is a small amount of potassium in lactated ringer. Treat the patient's pain and then look for the signs of hyperkalemia. Those can be shock hyperacute T waves on an, on an EKG tracing, uh, ventricular tachycardia, cardiac arrest. Um, immediately before you know the patient's potassium, if you're really worried, you can give a sodium zirconium silosilicate. It's, it's actually a, gas, a cation exchanger. It's oral pill. So when the patient gets to the ER, they have had a crush injury, you're suspicious. So first, this is usually a trauma patient. So you're going to treat them like a trauma. So ABCVs, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, examination, and just look for any sign of major injury. Make sure you address hypovolemia, I mean, pretty immediately. So any bleeding, you're going to try to stop the bleeding. So you're going to do tourniquets or compression. Um, and then they can also get distributive shock because they've had this major inflammatory response to reperfusion injury. So they've had so much cell death and then they're trying to reperfuse all this tissue and it leads to a massive amount of swelling and then they can third space. So they have really low blood pressure. So sometimes they just need blood or fluid, sorry. So just normal saline if they're not bleeding. So Again, look for signs of hyperkalemia and check the potassium as quick as you can. If you can, uh, check their EKG. If you see any signs of hy hyperkalemia, you see the hyperacute T waves, certain ventricular tachycardia, or your potassium comes back elevated, you want to give calcium to stabilize the cardiac membrane. Insulin, um, either with or without dextrose, depending on the glucose, sodium bicarbonate, albuterol, and then if you need to, dialysis. So with the crush injury itself, the, uh, the extremity injury, you're going to make sure that you get usually orthopedic surgery involved and then deal with those orthopedic injuries. If they need reduction, you should reduce them immediately. Um, if they need imaging, you know, getting CAT scans, x-rays, as soon as you can to address those injuries, that will, the faster you can uh, treat the injuries and kind of help with those underlying things, the quicker and less likely you are for them to develop a secondary compartment syndrome, which are highly likely in this case. So another thing with crushed injury, you're going to see this rhabdomyolysis and it's kind of my way of touching on rhabdomyolysis, but it is a, so with lab studies, if you're evaluating, you're worried about it, you're going to get a creatinine kinase. Typically in these patients, they're going to be, you know, more than five times the limit. I'm not sure what your unit of measurements are, but they're going to be very elevated, the creatinine kinase. 
On CMP, you can find um, abnormalities with the kidney function pretty quickly. And then a urine, you can check for myoglobinuria. And then you can also see elevated lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. So consult surgery if you need to and orthopedic surgery with the rhabdo, you're, you're really just addressing the injuries like with the other things. As far as treatment, the biggest treatment, the main treatment is just normal saline. And typically we'll, you can put in fully in, in this case to closely monitor your urine output and then give one milliliter. So you're gonna give fluid until you get the desired effect of one milliliter per kilogram per hour to three milli milliliters per kilogram per hour up to 300 of urine output. So you wanna make sure you get a lot of urine output. And you're basically just trying to help your kidneys flush everything and all that muscle buildup. So you're just monitoring urine output for that goal. And some nephrologists will use other fluids and, you know, but normal saline is usually a safe bet. So long-term effects of crush injury occur very frequently. So these are patients that need continued monitoring. They're going to need to usually be in an ICU level setting. They're going to need continued monitoring of their creatinine kinase, their renal function, um, make sure they don't have a metabolic acidosis. Going to need to closely watch compartments for development of compartment syndrome if they have not already developed it. Get frequent neurovascular checks of the extremity. Sometimes you can, the, sw the swelling that you'll get later with these can cause not only compartment syndrome, but uh, where the, you're just getting the vascular any collaterals will be occluded. And then looking, seeing if you missed any injuries or trauma and then any psychosocial support, you know, these people end up losing that, like that picture we showed and might lose an extremity. So helping them get support they need. So gonna go back to the same case, two questions that we'll kind of talk about with the same case, just to kind of touch up as we finish up. And so, a, 28 year old male. So same guy working his construction site, the concrete fell. He was erecting onto his left lower extremity. Despite attempts to look emergency responders to, it took emergency responders two hours to remove this lab from his extremity. He denies other injuries. He did not hit his head or lose consciousness. He has no past medical history. Um, vital signs are the same. Like we talked about left leg is shown. So upon arrival to the emergency department, after your trauma evaluation is obtained and you've gotten this EKG, what should be given immediately while waiting for his labs? So mm -hmm. there is his EKG. Yeah. Excellent job, guys. A is perfect. So A, you're going to get this. You have to give him two grams of calcium gluconite. So this guy has had a sustained crush injury where he's killed so much muscle tissue. And and then he's been that when the minute that concrete was released, everything starts to get reperfused. And he's getting this huge surge and rush of potassium as part of that reperfusion injury and and in this case, we don't know what his potassium is, but we can see these huge T waves and we don't want to wait because in this case, this could lead to ventricular tachycardia or other abnormalities. So totally safe giving them two grams of calcium gluconate. Hopefully your labs will come back. So great. So same guy. <laughs> so his patient's labs have resulted and he, this We've improved his potassium a little bit, but he has a creatinine kinase of 50,000. His potassium is 5.3, his creatinine is 3.4, and his BUN is 65. And the 50,000 is 10 times what you're, or yeah, even more, 10 times the normal range. Um, along with consulting orthopedic surgery, which treatment should be initiated? A. Start normal saline, place a Foley catheter for close urine output monitoring with goal of one to three milliliters per kilogram per hour. Consult nephrology, start sodium bicarbonate infusion, or discuss the need for extremity amputation with orthopedic surgery. Yeah. 
Great job, guys. Same. So start normal saline, place a Foley and monitor his urine output. So this guy, in addition to this, has now sustained his crush syndrome with his crush injury and has gone into rhabdomyolysis where he, because of that muscle breakdown with that creatinine kinase at 50,000. Uh, and then he's already going into kidney failure. His creatinine and his BUN are elevated, probably all occurring fairly rapidly since he's just gotten to you. So in this case, you do want to start the normal saline, place his Foley and monitor that urine output. And, you know, it's important for you as an ER doctor, and I kind of put this here because, you know, when you see a patient like this, everybody's going to just be like very drawn to that extremity. That's just the nature of what we do. And you're going to look at it and want to just deal with that. And it, it should be dealt with, yes, to try to salvage the limb, but he, you have to make sure there's not other things going on or that injury didn't lead to other things going on that will inevitably lead to his demise or kill him because that's your job as the ER doctor. You know, we're not the orthopedic surgeon. Your do job as the ER doctor is to make sure everything is being done and that you're looking at the person as a whole and the big picture. And in these crush injuries and crush syndromes, the big picture is the long-term, the other effects and the systemic effects of the elevated potassium, the kidney failure, you know, those other things while you're also addressing the extremity so that you can save your patient's life. And then hopefully the other teams can work together to save his limb. So wanted to kind of touch on that, so drifting a little bit from orthopedics, but there wasn't a good place in this I saw in your curriculum. And I wanted to make sure that it was addressed because I think that this is something that you guys see. And, you know, with orthopedic surgery, a lot of us see it frequently. We know kind of how to deal with it. And some of this stuff we see less. So it's important to kind of remind ourselves and, and go through it and it, it ties in. So that is it for this lecture, but I would love any thoughts or if you have any cases, questions.